So let me introduce myself first. My name's Simeon. I've been guiding here in Mexico for years. Started in El Potrero Chico, ended up moving a little bit farther south down to central Mexico uh, for a number of reasons. And we'll go into that as we get, you know, as we go through this show. I hope that anybody who's here watching really enjoys it uh, as much as uh, Shani and I, my girlfriend, who's also uh, participating uh, as much as we had putting it together, because it really is, you know, it gives us a great idea of what's going on here in Mexico right now. One of the things I'd like to say is that uh, with COVID, everything is a little bit strange in the world. And because of that, it really did force me to modernize, which is going to Zoom instead of doing slideshows and climbing gyms. And I think that if there was one thing, one good thing to come from COVID, which I don't know if there's many, but if there's one good thing to come from COVID, it's that it forced me out of doing slideshows and climbing gyms and it pushed me into a better platform, which can reach more people. Because from the registrations, I see people were, you know, coming in from all over the place. So firstly, I'd like what I'd like to do is I wanted to thank Shawnee, my girlfriend, because without her, this would have been really difficult because all of her skills with the computer and setting up the setting this all up really turned out perfect. And I wanted to thank her first. And then secondly, I wanted to thank uh, Carlos, which is my main guide. Hopefully he'll be joining in with us at some point. Because Carlos is a fantastic human being. Uh, if, People don't know who he is. He's Carlos Garcia. He's here in Mexico. He's pretty much a legend here in Mexico because he bolted lots and lots of routes in different areas. Not only that, but he's also an alpinist, which has put routes, alpine routes up in, I guess, pretty much every country where there's a mountain that's cold enough to where you shiver the entire time. So he's put routes up all over the world in Africa, and he's put routes up in Patagonia and all over. So he's quite well known that way. And also he uh, has also put up a lot of long routes. So I wanted to thank Carlos because uh, a few of the pictures that I used within this slideshow, you know, but this presentation were his because I didn't have good enough resolution or one thing or another. And I asked him in two seconds flat, he was nice enough to get me all the information I needed and better pictures. So Carlos, I appreciate that a lot. Also, uh, uh, just to let everybody know that the pictures, a lot of the pictures that I took on here were now, nowadays, I guess everything gets taken from a cell phone. So if they do look a little bit weird or a little bit grainy, this, you know, point and shoot with the old iPhone. And uh, I think that uh, either way, I think that they're quite nice pictures. All right, so to get started, today's topics, the overview of the Mexican rock climbing areas, logistics, rest day activities, and at the end, we can have a question and answer session from whoever's attending if you have any specific questions. So that's, that's pretty straightforward stuff. As far as who I am, rock climbing guide, I live down here in Mexico. Uh, I've been in Acuco for three years. I was up in the Potrero for 15 years, developing routes and guiding there. As I will talk about as we get through here, why exactly I left the Potrero and came a little bit farther south. Uh, PCGI is who I use as far as my certifications instead of uh, AMGA. I like the PCGI a lot because they go on what the AMJ is. Uh, PCGI, they're a little bit more uh, committed to their guides past the trainings because they go so far as to get us insurance, which is huge, and also they help uh, build your business. So PCGI, I like them a lot. And if anybody ever wanted to talk about that further, they could email me and we can go into that. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to go with guidebooks? What we're going to do is we're going to talk about guidebooks for Mexico as well, because a lot has happened in the last five years for guidebooks here. And what people have to understand is that in Mexico, climbing here really only took off for the whole of Mexico in the past 10 years. And that has to do with the middle class in Mexico. NAFTA in the United States changed everything. NAFTA, what it did was it pushed all of the jobs for not all of them, but a lot of the jobs in the United States across the border. And by doing that, it created a pretty large middle class, which Mexico never had. So without their middle class, they had the rich people and the poor people. So the wealthy people were the only ones that were out there going out and climbing and they weren't big developers. They would travel 
other places. Now that Mexico has a very solid, healthy middle class, there's a lot of people who have Saturday and Sunday off and they're going out there and getting at it. So why don't we do this? We'll just keep on going. I am a rail developer as well. You know, as Joseph knows who's on the call, I've put up a bunch of routes in the Potrero. I've put up routes in Pennsylvania, New York, uh, the New River Gorge, uh, the Red River Gorge, Mount Charleston. And I could say beyond any doubt that if you get on any route with my name on it, not only is it going to be enjoyable because I don't develop junk, but it's also going to be bolted really well. And that's important for climbers these days too, is because nobody wants to get hurt. The days of run out, scary bolting are gone. Nobody can afford to hurt themselves because if you, you hurt yourself, that could not only take you out of climbing, but it could put, well, it takes you out of climbing for two reasons. One, you're injured and two, you have so many bills that you can't go climbing because you're working all the time. So, you know, with that, leave that as it may. So here's the overview of Mexico rock climbing areas, part one. That's a picture of my buddy, Bobby Ferrari right there. Joseph, you met Bobby when you were up in the Gunks uh, and that's a crack climb here in, in the cool kill. And we warmed up on that. And I can tell you right now, he was none too happy to, see, to get on that as a warm up. but you know, you gotta, you gotta do these things, you got to. All right, so as far as major rock, rock climbing areas in the near, nearby airports, if you're flying in, chances are you're either gonna fly into Monterrey or Queretaro. These are the two airports from Mexico that we wanna talk about. Yeah, Mexico City, everybody's like, should I fly into Mexico City? Should I fly into Mexico City? There's reasons why I tell everybody that it's better to fly in Queretaro. We'll get into that right now. So here's a little list on here, El Salto, El Potrero, Culo de Gato, but they did Dios and it lists all of the different climbing areas that we're gonna to cover tonight. I'm not going to go through them too much right now because we'll go through them individually. But if you ever want to go back and watch this presentation again, you can see where they're located in Mexico. You can see where Monterrey is, MTY, that's the airport code, and QRO for Queretaro. So you can see when I moved, I kind of took a quite the jaunt. I took a quite the distance from where I was before. All right. Entering Mexico, flying or driving. This is really important for anybody listening right now. If you were to fly into Monterrey, perfect. You're going to Monterrey, Mexico. People in the past have told me that they that they booked the ticket to Monterrey and they ended up in California. Luckily, I haven't heard that in a long time, but I felt really bad for the people when they got off the plane and they said they looked out and there was palm trees and all these people walking around. And they're like, why are there so many gringos around here? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't they all be Mexicans? And then they told me that they realized they booked the, the flight in the wrong place. I felt really bad for them. As far as flying into Monterrey, the only thing that I'm going to say is you fly into Monterrey and you're going to go to the Potrero, please take a taxi directly from the airport. Don't have anybody pick you up from the Potrero. And there's a major difference here. And this is really important. Is that if you somehow meet somebody in the Potrero site or one thing or another, and they're like, yeah, I'll come pick you up and bring you back. That's great. And that's really nice of them, but there's a huge difference between them and the taxis in the airport. And it's called insurance. Once upon a time, I knew a girl who got into a taxi from the Potrero and they weren't insured and they got into a car accident and they had they were not covered for her medical expenses. That's the main reason to get just walk off the plane, go through the customs, you walk out the door and there's taxi services that know exactly where you're going and all those guys are professional. They know exactly where you want to go and they're insured. That's all I have to say about flying in a Monterrey. As far as driving in a Mont driving, if you're going to drive into Mexico, this is key information. If you go online, there's a thing when you drive your car across the border that you have to get a sticker on your car and that sticker is good for six months. If you go online, there is a bank, it's Ban Banjarcito, and I can give people the link for them as well, that you can actually go online, you can get your uh, import for your vehicle, the sticker that goes on your windshield, and they'll send it to your house via DHL. This is huge, because when you go to the border, nobody there really speaks English, and if you don't speak any Espanol, it can get very confusing very fast by doing it through the bank and getting it overnighted to you by DHL, then you could stick that on your car. And then when you pass over the border, you just run on in, get your, uh, get your permit, permiso as far as uh, coming into the country as a person, which is all of your, you know, your documentation as far as your visa and be out the door 
10 minutes flat. It's so easy and you don't have to do anything else. So like I said, if anybody wants that link, we can do that later. And it's really good because all you do is click, click, click. Next thing you know, you have the sticker in your mailbox. All right. So as Sims far as the note, don't if forget you, to turn it into to the chat and go back. Oh yeah. Oh, that's so huge. If you leave Mexico and what they really don't talk about much is that there is a little shack as, as great, great way to put it. It's a little shack that's sitting there that you wouldn't even know why it's there. That you bring your car over, they check the VIN number, they check the VIN number on the sticker, they click the sticker and it's there for thereby voided out. If you leave Mexico and you don't give back, back that sticker, the next time you go into the country, it is, Needless to say, no, to put it mildly, it's a huge, it's a huge pain in the ass. To put it mildly, so giving back that sticker is huge. Corey, nice to see you, looking good. So, um, that's that's really really good beta as far as giving that sticker back. I like driving to Mexico. Anybody from Texas, it really is uh, easy because the pay roads are in really good shape. They're worth every cent and you can move around fast. Like I drive all the way from New York state, all the way across the country. And once I cross into Mexico, I just feel better about things because once you get on that pay road, A, you could do hundred miles an hour if you wanted to, because nobody cares, which I do not with my four wheel drive van, that would be not, not a good, good thing to do. But once you get on the pay roads, they're in really good shape. And, uh, they're smooth and they're I think, better conditioned than a lot of the roads in the United States. If you ever driven Louisiana or if you've driven in Mississippi or you've driven in Alabama or anywhere around there, yeah, you got to be on your A game the whole day. So, all right, so let's keep going. Uh, rental cars, if you flew in a, into uh, Canetero, which I suggest for anybody who isn't climbing in the north, if you, if you go into Canetero, rent a car. It's like $90 a week, and all you have to do is have a credit card that covers your insurance. That's huge because if you go to rent the car and you don't present that credit card, they want you to carry their insurance. So it goes from $90 up to like $350 for a week. If you have the credit card that gives you sky miles, it gives you all these perks, and usually a lot of credit cards give you that perk that says that your insurance is covered if you're driving a rental car out of the country, or in the United States, that's the one you want to get. For $90 for a week, it is such a bargain. I'm not muted. Simeon. So last time we were there, I had all the yes, sir. I had all the stuff from the United States, and they wouldn't rent me the car unless I bought insurance there. So you might you then you go to a different now. car. Yeah, different car company. Oh, it, yep. well, then you have to go next door and use a different. It was the one right in the in the airport. I'll find out. Yeah. So people should just be aware. Yeah, that there's, there's, yeah, there's seven different uh, rental companies right there in the airport, six or seven. And if somebody says that to you, then you could just walk right on to the next one. And that's great beta as well. I'm glad that you said that, Alan, because yeah. now I can update people when they come in that if anybody says something like that, just walk next door because that's where they make their money. Remember, that's yeah. how the rental car companies make their money is selling that insurance. There were only two so, uh, rent, renting a car for $90 a week. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The cars are cheap. There was cars only two. Cars are cheap, roads are good. Uh, all right, great. So what we'll do is this, let's keep on moving along because I don't want to slow down too much. Where we're going to cover it today is the Potrero, Northern Mexico. Culo de Gato, the ass of the cat or the cat's ass, which is next door to the Potrero. El Salto, which people have heard about. A lot of people don't know exactly where it's located, but that's uh, leaving Monterrey headed south on one of the main roads. Fuente de Dios, is also near El Salto, but it's a little farther on down the line on the same mountain range. So that would be Northern Mexico. And then down here in Central Mexico, we're gonna be looking at Peña de Bernal, La Concepcion, where I live here in Aculco, Las Peñas de Texcaní, Las Manzanas, El Chonta, 
El Chonta is a very popular area for the strong men. El Chonta is where a lot of people come down here because they're vying, they're looking just, they're directed themselves right towards the sala climbing there. And then El Parque Nacional El Chico, which is a national park here in Mexico. So what we'll do is you can see that and what is listed here is the towns that they're in, the climbing type, rock type, typical grade, and uh, the routes that they have, and then the temperature range. Because people have to remember is that the temperatures in Mexico vary greatly. Northern Mexico, it can get down to 40 degrees, 30 degrees and stay there for a week. It's really, I would consider, well, I, this is, I can consider it Texas because before the United States pushed the border, Mexico was Texas. So Texas weather, Mexico weather, very similar. And it's very important to check the weather before you come down because you not, might not only want your puffy jacket, you might want to double up your puffy jacket if you're going to the Potrero. You have to be very careful. All right. Guide books. This is the meat and potatoes of it right here. The two guidebooks, it says center and south and north. Those were printed uh, seven years ago. And I would tell anybody watching this uh, with me who's participating that you would want to find these books because you can get them online and purchase them because not only are they good information on Mexico, but also they're excellent just to set out on the table so people can pick them up and look at the pictures. The pictures in these books are really excellent. And when you look at different climbing areas listed and you say there's no way the rock could possibly look like that, then you turn the page and there's somebody climbing a different route that the rock looks exactly the same. You realize the variations of different types of rock in Mexico, which is excellent. Um, Bernal and Aculco, those two books are on rack up. I wrote uh, them in the last few years. The book to Bernal, well, there wasn't one. The book that was for Bernal was so outdated that it was really almost unusable. So I did that book first, uh, printed it, and then realized that rack up is really the way of the future. And I decided to go there now instead of doing print copies. At Culco de Espinosa, which is the crack climbing area that I live near, I did this one last year and they're both totally worth picking up just to look at the different grades. Uh, El Potrero Chico, that's my book that I wrote a number of years ago that's still in the Potrero, it's still available. There's other books for the Potrero. Everybody's book I guess is good. They're just written for different people that are looking for different things. My book, I'm a rock climbing guide. So as you read through it, you can actually see that it's written by a guide because it tells you what's dangerous and it tells you what you need to know as far as background data, as far as getting up a climb fast and getting down a climb safely. If the gentleman, I hate to say this, but if the gentleman, Brad Gobright had read my book, if he had read my book before he went up and did that route, he would have seen by any, beyond any doubt, that you cannot get off of El Sendero Luminoso with a 70 meter rope. It just doesn't work. And I'm so sorry what happened went on. And I can't say that, you know, he might not have made the same mistakes. Actually, it was his partner who made the mistakes, even if they had read my book. But it says in big bold letters that you need double ropes to get off that. It was bolted a long time ago by guys that were, uh, it was just a different time when people used 50s and 60s were just coming in and they were very strong and they had fixed lines there and they had all sorts of things and they just stretched the pitches. And I could tell a story about that because I met a gentleman who was there that day who was climbing the route at the same time that they were, that they were and it's pretty, it's pretty sad, pretty sad tale because it was completely avoidable if they had just tied knots. So as we keep moving, Northern Mexico, there's my buddy Rick prolific developer in Mexico. He's 70, year old, 70 years old this year, and he has 36 pitches now, I think, that he's bolted all by himself in an area that nobody knows about. It's the best climbing in the Potrero that nobody may ever do, because the only way you get up there is if you go up with Rick, because he knows all the grades, and he knows, he knows you know, exactly what to get people on as far as what they're comfortable leading. <sighs> Pictures of the Potrero. It is just a beautiful place. It really is. Looking into the canyon in this, in this angle, you can see the spires in the background. That's looking at the Virgin Canyon, looking at El Toro from, from up high. 
and then some pictures of just you know the climbing there the climbing on the left with the palm tree that was when we were fixing the routes up at la playa nobody ever climbs at la playa hardly ever and we went up there my friends and i and we climbed all the routes when i was putting together the guidebook and then we figured out what was wrong and we fixed them and separated anchors and replaced anchors la playa is just fantastic climbing uh, on the right, just a distance view. If you go to the Potrero and you have the time and you have the rest day hiking around there, it's just wonderful. So what I'll do now is I'll just go through, I have some stuff written down here. The Potrero, of course, is in the state in Nuevo Leon. As far as payment goes in the Potrero, sometimes you pay, sometimes you don't. It all depends on the town, who's running the town and how much they wanna send somebody up there to take money. It's multi-pitch climbing, of course. It's all sport climbing. Nobody needs to bring the rack there. The old uh, trad lines that are there never get done because the rock just can't support it. If you fall on gear there, there's a really good chance the rock's gonna fail. Um, 2,300 feet tall for anybody who hasn't been there. It is just a wonderful place. I mean, as far as multi-pitch sport, it really is a wonderful place to go. The spires, everybody should do the spire routes. They're just fantastic. From Monterey International Airport, it's a 45 minutes from the airport. Not too far, not too close. It's pretty easy. And like I said, you want to jump into a taxi that's directly from that airport where they're actually, you know, uh, that's what they do for a living. Um, people usually, usually visit, usually November, and then they visit December, New Year's being in the past the most busy, and it goes all the way through the March. Be very careful that you check the weather before you go because it can get very cold there because the weather is quite unstable. Uh, it is, you know, it gets the weather patterns in the United States. Um, if you go there on New Year's, you want to be extra careful this year because of COVID and the, I, you know, a lot of things there haven't really caught up to modern day, like washing things and cold water and such like that, that just doesn't kill germs. So you just want to be careful. Um, what people don't realize about the, about the Potrero is because everybody goes there to do the multi-pitch is that El Potrero Chico has the largest concentration of great 512s out of any area, uh, probably on the Northern continent. Red Rocks has a lot of good 512s too, but as far as concentration and really good climbs, single pitch climbs, multi-pitch climbs, the Potrero is the rock. The rock really lends itself to 512. And people say, but I don't climb 512. I'm like, well, the only way that you get to climb 512 is by getting on 511s and going and trying it. A stick clip, I'm a 514 stick clipper. I mean, that's the bottom line. I can get through anything with a stick clip. So really, it's worth trying. Um, Multi-pitch moderates, just always be careful there because the routes, except for Estreita, they all wrap the same line. So even if you're cognizant, you get up really early and you're the first person on a route, if other people come up behind you and you repel past them, well, at some point they're gonna be coming back down too and they pull rocks and that's the thing is that you're so far away from each other, even if they yelled rock at the top of their lungs a hundred times, you might not hear it. So a lot of times if you get there and you see there's already people on a route, make a decision whether or not you wanna go do something else because there's lots and lots of really good multi-pitch routes there. Even if you get in over your head on something, normally you can hang on a bolt and just hang dog and move through something even if it's a little harder than you wanna do. Um, as far as lodging, this is important and this is why I'm glad everybody's here, is that lodging this year is very difficult because COVID is in Mexico as it is in the United States and the campgrounds there are all struggling to deal with it because now you're talking about the same ideas as you know the antibacterial for your hands and things like that, but they're really not having a lot of camping. This year, everything comes down to kind of laying in a bed. So if people are interested in going to the Potrero, it's worthwhile Airbnb and look for either uh, houses there that are Airbnb or get a hold of me and I can turn you on to people who have really nice houses where you can get in and you can have your own personal space. So that way you can limit your interaction with people as far as like the campgrounds when people all are in a communal kitchen, that's a recipe for disaster. So they're doing very little, if any of the camping where people set up tents and they're relying more on just filling up beds. Um, uh, let's see here, rest days. 
exploring the canyon and then the hot springs. The Potrero is kind of limited as far as rest days go because going to Monterey is uh, increasingly difficult because if people don't have vehicles and getting on the public transportation, you're, you know, you're shaking hands as, you're shaking hands with problems if you're going to go try to get on, you know, if you're going to go down into the masses of people into Monterey because they do have a problem with COVID right now, as do other big cities. So as far as the rest days there and the hot springs, I would say Monday through Friday, go to the hot springs, Saturday, Sunday, they're going to be busy. So if you wanted to go there and you wanted to try to secure yourself as far as being uh, in a better position not to be around people or not to get involved with COVID, that would be the best thing you could do. Um, the last beta I have for the Potrero, as we click through, is if you fly in and you're flying the Potrero, take your shoes, your harness, and put them in your carry-on. Don't check those important items because if something happens and you get separated from your bag, you are so beat because nobody there can, can help you out. So the best beta that I can give you is that you want to carry those two with you. You know, your shoes and your harness, everything else. If you don't have your clothes, you can wear the same stinky pair of underwear for a couple days until they find your stuff. But as far as not having those zapatos, if you don't have the shoes, yeah, I mean, this is going to be a struggle. Last thing, the weather in the Potrero, if it's raining outside the canyon, definitely go inside the canyon and climb because the peaks are about 3,000 feet tall, it blocks out about 90% of the rain. It's very rare that it rains inside the canyon when it's raining outside. It's called orographic lifting. The weather hits the front of the mountain, it rolls up the mountain, it spins over on itself like a wave and it rains. Inside the canyon, it's almost always dry. We've seen it for years and years and years where it's raining a little bit outside and people are like, well, that's our day. No, it doesn't have to be at all. You come inside the canyon and it might be the best day you've had because the, because the sun's blocked out. You can climb in the shade all day and pick, pick the climbs you want to get on. All right. Culo de Gato. If you see the picture with the, uh, with the picture with the sign in it and you see the peak to the right of it, that peak right there is what you're looking at in the other picture with the person climbing. I think that was me climbing, but I can't remember. I might've taken that picture. That's La Palmaritos, La Palmaritosa. That's the mountain that you see in the background. And that is one of the bigger mountains you see inside the Potrero. So that gives you an idea how close they are together. Um, Culo de Gato is really cool. It's a great place to go if you have uh, availability to a vehicle or if somebody has a pickup truck and you want to jump in the back. Uh, that's about as COVID friendly as you can get with the air rushing by you doing 50 miles an hour ramp, ramping on down the road. But uh, Kula Gato, it's limestone, vertical to overhanging, single pitch, and it's sport. And the, and the pitches are up to 30 meters. So they're just like the Potrero, they're long pitches. Um, it's about a 30 minute drive from the Potrero, a little bit less if you drive fast. Um, the Cat's Ass is a great day trip from the LPC. If you're in the Potrero and it's busy and somebody says they're looking for something else to do because it's just too busy and you know it's just a little overwhelming, especially on Saturday or Sunday when they start partying in the canyon, uh, the, the locals partying. If you go out to the Kulo, uh, lots of quality routes and it's very quiet. And the vista there in the desert, you can see where we're climbing versus looking down in the desert. It's really a beautiful place to go. So I can't, can't say enough about what a great day trip that is. It, it, it gets a little bit too much. In, uh, in the post trail. All right, so moving right along. I think El Salto. I, was Alex Joseph? I think I was there when Alex put up the first route in Kula de Gato. Back in Are you? Yeah, 96? I mean, Alex was, yeah. 98. 96, very prolific developer. Yep, Alex Catlin, uh, Beyond being a wonderful human being to hang out with, very strong climber. I think he was sending 14s when he was 14 years old or something. Like he was a prodigy or whatever you want to call climbing prodigy, however that goes. Uh, Alex was very good climber when he was young and he was in Texas doing his doctoral thesis. And that's how he had the opportunity to go to the Potrero. And that's also why he had so much time on his hands because you know, when you're, when you're do, working on your PhD, uh, you know, you can take as much time as you really want. Nobody's gonna push you on that. So he was there and yeah, he did uh, develop a lot. I think he put up the sixth, sixth dimension, which is 14C now, but I think that man boy actually freed it. 
You know, I think that he put it up, somebody else actually ended up doing it. So on to El Salto. El Salto is what would be south east of Monterrey. It's in the same mountains as Lava Steca Canyon, a little bit farther south. El Salto is a fantastic place to go visit. Uh, it's limestone, it's tufas, it's overhanging, 30 meter sport climbing, uh, mostly single pitch. There are some multi-pitch there, but people really don't go to El Salto to do any multi-pitch stuff. Um, from Monterrey International Airport, it really is best to have somebody that has a car because getting there is kind of a hike. You have to go through the city, but you know, I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what it is, where it is, and, you know, the climbing there, because it really is wonderful. It's a great place to go. It's higher altitude than the Potrero. So you have to be very careful because a lot of the climbing's in the shade and you could honestly freeze your butt off up there just trying to get going. A lot of people wait until the sun starts coming around to warm things up, but I'm more of a, uh, in the shade climber. I like being in the shade all day. If the sun touches me, I'm kind of like a vampire. I run away. I really, if, I, if you're going to climb hard, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to climb really hard, you have to climb in the shade because your feet, especially on the limestone, all just go bye-bye. Your feet go bye-bye as soon as the sun comes on, if you're climbing that hard. So uh, climbing in El Salto is amazing. You get really strong on overhanging terrain. That's one thing about El Salto. It'll make you strong. It's beautiful. It's beautiful stone. I just love laying there watching people climb and just looking at the place. It is just gorgeous. As far as lodging there, there are cabins all over there now. Uh, people go there in the summertime because it's higher altitude and they escape the heat of Monterrey because Monterrey gets very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. So people go there to escape the heat. Uh, it's easy Airbnb. All you have to do is you know put in El Salto in the search engine and you'll find what's there. If anybody needs help beyond that, you just let me know. I'm always willing to help people at any time. It's still just an email, an email away. Um, rest days, really exploring the canyon. You're pretty, you're pretty far out there. There's not a whole lot going on out there as far as uh, you know, besides climbing and hiking around. Puente de Dios. Again, this is farther south along the same mountain range as. Uh, uh, El Salto. Puente de Dios is a really cool place if you have a vehicle. This is another one to where if you're going to go there, it really is worth being able to drive there. And I, I'm van life. I'm a van life kind of guy. I don't really like sleeping on the ground. I haven't really in years. So my van goes anywhere. I have a four-wheel drive conversion van and it really can go anywhere. And Puente de Dios there's a road that goes right across the top of that arch. So you can park up there. There's a parking place and there's bathrooms and you can walk right down a stairwell. It takes about 30 seconds to get in there and it's all downhill. That's my kind of approach. But the DDOS is also uh, limestone. It's single pitch, 30 meter pitches. It's vertical or overhanging. That's uh, really, you know, uh, Different limestone is not the same as what's in the Potrero, as you can see by the color. This is more dolomite. This has got different uh, makeup of the, of the limestone, a little bit softer than the Potrero, and it's a little crumblier. If it saw a quarter of the traffic of the Potrero, the place would clean right up. What is really cool about it is if you look at that picture where you can see right through the arch, there's a lifetime's worth of climbing there. If people are strong enough, you could bolt a climb going in one side and right out the other side. It's really a cool place. Um, as far as, uh, there's always shade to be had there as well. Shot sun or shade, obviously, you just run around to one side of the arch or the other. Lodging there, it's tough. It's really car camping or setting out a tent and the town really isn't nearby. So you'd have to be pretty self-sufficient if you go there. I added this to the list just because I wanted people to see it because it really is quite interesting. Oh, and it's free as well. Nobody, nobody there. Uh, once we get the vaccine going, the town that's below Puente de Dios is really cool. But I know for a fact that they don't really want a lot of people coming in there because they do not have uh, any type of infrastructure if people in the town start getting sick because it is a mountain town. What else is cool about Puente de Dios as far as a rest day is that the largest sinkhole in the entire, entire world is right up the road from there. It's this huge, like, I don't know, it's a sinkhole. It's just this huge plot of land that fell onto the earth. 
and it's kind of cool to go there and check it out because you know if you're if you're an explorer which most of us are as, as rock climbers we're all explorers that's why we rock climb we just like to explore vertically and hike around and see cool things well that's really cool to check out all right so here we go central mexico climbing and culture now we've gone from northern mexico and now we're down to central mexico so that right there is Peña de Bernal. We've gone from limestone into the volcanic belt. Uh, Peña de Bernal is the largest monolith in the world. Now, I say that and people have questioned it because people say Sugarloaf is, people say uh, different things in Brazil are, but then people want to talk about what an actual monolith is. A monolith is circular around to where you can walk all the way around it. And the only way you're getting to the top is if you're rock climbing. That's what a monolith really is. So this one being just shy of 2000 feet tall is the largest monolith in the, earth, in the world. This is a porphyritic granite. This is granite, but it's porphyry. It's small crystal granite. So whereas jo Joshua Tree, which is amazing. I love Joshua Tree. It's one of my favorite places in the US. This is completely different. Same rock, but the size of the crystals are completely different. They're a lot smaller. Sport climbing, bouldering, single pitch, long multi-pitch routes. It's all sport climbing. There are trad climbs there, but I hesitate to say to bring your gear rack there because nobody has done these trad climbs in probably 25 years. And the ones that I've tried have been absolutely terrifying because I don't know if they cleaned, I don't know if they ever cleaned them the day that they went up there. So now 25 years later, that's, you know, it definitely gets your attention. So let's just stick with the multi-pitch sport climbing. The bouldering there is world-class. And when I say that, uh, I don't do a lot of bouldering, but everybody who's ever been there and there's bouldering pads at the campground on the backside called Chichido, you can go in there and you can borrow bouldering pads. If you're into bouldering, this is a very cool place to, place to go. This is in the state of Queretaro. You definitely fly in to, to uh, the uh, airport in, in Queretaro. So Queretaro is the state of Queretaro and it's in Bernal, that's the town. The town of Bernal is what's considered a magic town. There are some climbing pictures, some more. There's a gentleman bouldering, that boy is strong. When I was sitting there that day, I was shocked at heart how that boy could hang on, very shocking more climbing pictures of Bernal. It's a beautiful place. And that's a picture from the town. So the town of Bernal is a magic town. So Pueblo, Mexico. And in Mexico to get that designation, something really cool has to be going on. They just don't give you the designation for a magic town just willy nilly. So with the Pueblo, Mexico, this town is very, very, very nice. When I tell people that they want to come here because uh, the climbing's good, oh, it definitely is. When I tell people they want to come here because the town is that nice, there is an Italian restaurant in that town that the gentleman, when you walk in, has pictures all over the walls of the Dolomites because the guy, uh, he's Flavio, Flavio, he's from the Dolomites. I mean, he's an Italian man running an Italian restaurant in Bernal, and it is just delicious food. And next door is, in a, is in a, a, a Mexican restaurant in Mexico, and that Mexican restaurant is the best food I've ever eaten in Mexico bar none, and it's super inexpensive. To go there and have beers, an appetizer, a main course, and dessert, because I can eat when I'm climbing. If I'm putting out the calories, I can put them right back in at night. If you eat everything, you'll walk out of there, $20. And that's with alcohol. So it really is a good time. Yeah, and for somebody who likes to eat, if I can spend $20 and have everything, everything and then some, I'm a happy camper. From the airport in Cadetero, you could take a taxi or you can rent a car. I always tell people to rent a car for 88 bucks. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth its weight in gold. That monolith is 15 minutes to 20 minutes away from the airport. And it's the easiest ride you could ever consider. You just go out the airport, make a left-hand turn, go about 15 minutes and there it is. You can't miss it. Yep, that just pokes out of the sky. And when you come around the corner and you see it, it is quite awe-inspiring. We are now in central Mexico, and that monolith sits at 7,500 feet tall. When you get to the top of that monolith, you're just shy of 10,000 feet in elevation. Because of that, 
the skies are always beautiful and the weather is always nice. When I tell you that the weather in central Mexico is like just like San Diego, uh, but you're in Mexico. So the weather there is perfect all the time. When people ask when they should go climbing in Bernal, I'm like, you can go climbing there. It's actually cooler in the summer than it is in the winter because there's clouds in the sky. In the summer, in the winter time, it's just blue, blue sky. And that blue sky allows the sun through and it can create, you know, it can get hotter, which is like balmy 80 degrees. That's balmy there. Magic Town, it's beautiful. Uh, let's see what else. The Rada Rock I talked about, the climbs range from anywhere five, six single pitch all the way up to 512 plus 513. There's 513 multi pitch climbs there. They have a little bit of everything. Um, let's see here. Rest days in the town of Bernal. If you want to take rest days, there's no shortage of things to do. Um, I tell most people to bring an extra bag with them, stick it in with your, with your luggage, whether it's a, like a gym bag or what have you, because the shopping there, just the rug store, the Serapes, they make all the wool rugs there themselves. And for $25 to $100, you can buy a rug that's so gorgeous that you stuff it in your, in your bag and check it on the way home. Um, also, there's hot springs right nearby. This is the wine route, the wine route. So there's lots of real good wine, the, the soil there to support vineyards. And the restaurants are delicious. And now Bernal says that they're the world's most famous gorditas. And that's a type of food, it's a gordita. And every place you go, they're like, we're world famous for gorditas. And I'm like, you're telling me that if I went all the way around the world to some unknown town in China, that they're gonna know about your gorditas? And they look at me and I'm like, all right, I'll just leave that as it may, but they are very good gorditas. They're, they're like I said, that when you go there, you can buy one for the equivalent of like eight or 10 cents and they stuff all sorts of good stuff in there, whether it's cactus or whatever you want, as far as meats and cheeses and everything, and they're really good. It's like a hot pocket. It's a hot pocket, but it's fresh. Um, another nice part about Bernal is that vegetarians aren't gonna go hungry. When I was in Northern Mexico, and this is honest to God, the truth, we went out to a restaurant and we had two vegetarians with us and a vegan, and when, I was explaining to the person who was taking our order that they was like, what's, what can we eat? And they told us, and they kept saying about meat. And I'm like, well, this person's a vegetarian. And the waiter looked right back at me and they're like, oh, then will they eat pork? And I looked at him and I'm like, yeah, let me explain this again. So in Northern Mexico, they really aren't big on the vegetables. Here in Central Mexico, vegetarians and vegans have no problem whatsoever. You can find anything for anybody. There's lots of lots of things that you can eat here that go right along with your diet. So there's no real dietary restrictions. All right, let's keep on moving. Horses, artisanal stuff. It really is a lot of fun walking around in Ecu I mean, in uh, Pernal. The horses there. Uh, when you go out with people who have horses, they're actual cowboys. Like these people, a lot of them. That's what their transportation is. And then uh, Yelado de uh, Cactus. What that's nice about that is that there's a lot of homemade ice cream in the town. And if you're into ice cream, that it really it is, it is special. People say, well, how, what would it taste like? Well, I'll just leave, leave that for you to find out. All right, so now at Culco de Espinosa, this is the town that I live in. So uh, La Cascada is one name. La Concepcion is another name. So La Cascada, the Cascade, and right there in front of you is a waterfall that isn't really running too hard right then. Uh, it's called La Concepcion because right near there is where the river starts. It's clean water, which is really nice. And it's also called uh, Aculco. People consider it because that's the nearest town. This is the town that I live in, Aculco de Espinosa. It's also a magic town. And the reason that Aculco is a magic town is because of uh, 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 Miguel Hidalgo. No, Manuel Hidalgo, right? So Hidalgo has his name in the Potrero. That's the town of Hidalgo. Then there's Sabinas Hidalgos. There's Hidalgos all over Mexico. And uh, the reason being is that he was a priest and he got 
the Mexican indigenous tribes to rise up against the Spain, the, you know, the government of Spain who were controlling Mexico in the late 1700s and 1800s. And he got them to rise up because he thought that they weren't treating the nat native Indians correctly. And it's a very interesting story. And I think that he and I would get along really well because he was a priest that had kids. He was a priest that uh, didn't really believe a lot of the what the Bible said as far as being literal. And he also believed that the Jews shouldn't have to convert to Christianity. And what else? He had all sorts of things that he did that uh, the church was aghast. But because he was also uh, very well educated and he uh, did lots of good for Mexico, he, uh, they, they, you know, they let a lot slide up until, of course, that he got uh, uh, 8,000 people to revolt. Then all of a sudden, it wasn't so good. So that, that's uh, why my town is so, uh, back to where I was going with that, my town is famous or culturally significant because when Hidalgo was rolling around causing all sorts of problems for the Spanish uh, government, he came through my town and he was held up there in the church. So that is the historical relevance of why my town is really special, other than it being beautiful. So I'm in the town of Aculco. It's in the state of Mexico. That right there is rhyolite crack climbing. It's not basalt. It's actually rhyolite. It's different because it uh, does not beat up your hands at all. It's really nice as far as it's like taking soap, cutting it in half and like for a crack if you put your hands in there. So it's very smooth on the hands and it's very technique driven. Um, you fly into Conecto International Airport. I'm about 55 minutes south of the airport. Rental car is best. You don't necessarily have to have a rental car, but it is the best if you want to travel around, as I said. This is a beautiful river valley. You can see in that picture behind me that the river is right there. And it's mostly sun or shade. We climb in that shade all day because, as I said, now Bernal is at 77,500 feet. Oh, I'm at 9,000 feet in elevation or 8,000 feet in elevation. I'm at 8,000 feet at my house. So this is perfect 75 degrees every day, day in and day out. Every day you wake up, it's chilly in the morning, you want a jacket, the sun comes out, goes up to 75 degrees, it stays there all day. Um, let's see here. Let's go into this. There's climbs here from 5'6 to 5'11, or 5'6 to 5'12, but 5'10 is the grade. If you know anything about crack climbing, for whatever reason, a lot of places like Paradise Forks and places like that, when they crack, when the, when, when the rock settles and it cracks, here it cracked, all the cracks are about the 510 range. They're harder and they're easier, but if you're a 510 crack climber, you're really gonna enjoy this place. It is very special. Um, I always tell people, when I ask people about four star routes, I'm like, what is it that makes a route, a one star route, two star routes, what makes a route four stars? With this canyon, writing a guidebook, I hesitated putting four stars on every route because people would look at it. They'd be like, how can every star before, every route be four stars? Well, I would invite people to come down here and check it out. It's because like the New River Gorge with their track climbing, when you touch that rock with your hands and you pick your feet up on the rock until you get to the top of the climb, you are gonna be struggling. It is game on. It's the nature of the rock, it's vertical, and it's extremely technique driven. People who climb here get very strong very fast because it, you have to. You're either gonna get strong or you're gonna fall off. Um, lodging, the town here, small tourist town. COVID has freaked them out because there's no cases in this town. There were two in March and they quarantined the people. This town is quarantined off. They do allow for climbing and for uh, tourists to be in the town now as far as climbers. And what they asked me is that if people wanna to come to this town that we set them up with an Airbnb. And from there, Monday through Friday, they can uh, go out to the restaurants and just do your COVID you know, precautions. And then Saturday and Sunday, when it does get a little bit busier, uh, what they would do is everybody has menus in the Airbnbs and you could just order in and uh, you can just have food delivered to your house. 
so that way if people coming that are that are tourists that come into the town which they're pretty quiet right now that way climbers don't risk getting uh covid from people from mexico city or vice versa because mexico city is three hours away and it is a tourist town if you like cheese if you like homemade ice cream and you like delicious food you're really going to like this town because it's all dairy farms and they bring their milk to the town the town lecheria takes all the milk they give it to the cheese people the cheese people make the cheese they bring it back to town and then they give it to the cheese shops because it was a very small microchasm of business and it works perfectly so there's like maybe 30 different variations of cheese in this town and uh yeah, like I said, if you're into cheese, you're going to like this town a lot. Uh, as far as there's also hotels here, very inexpensive, $30 a night for double occupancy for hotels, really, really well priced, nice hotels, hot water. I like the Airbnbs because you have kitchens. And then if you want, you can get up in the morning and make coffee. There's coffee shops in town. There's multiple restaurants in town, vegan, vegetarian friendly. Uh, a gentleman that I'm friends with is a vegetarian himself. He's a chef here in town and he uh, really knows how to whip out vegetarian meals because he's eating it every day himself. Uh, let's see here, rest days. As far as that cool go goes, wandering around in the town during rest day is absolutely wonderful because it is a magic town. It's gorgeous. There's a reason why I moved here from the north. I came here with a friend of mine, Bud Arbello, and we came into the town and I was here about all of five minutes. And when I saw how beautiful this town is, I decided right there on the spot that I was gonna sell my place in the Potrero and relocate the guide service here for a number of reasons, weather, climbing, rock type. There's 13 different kinds of rock within three hours of my house, totally different rock. And with that, that's a rock climber's dream. I can drive just an hour, hour and a half, go to another beautiful location to have different, totally different climbing. Um, rest days here. Horseback riding is fantastic because the mountains nearby have many, many trails for horseback riding. Hiking, Peña de Ñado is right near here, Ñado Mountain. Uh, Peña de Ñado, when you get to the summit of that, it's 11,000 feet. Beautiful, beautiful. And a clear day, they say you can see the volcanoes uh, that's, that are around Mexico City. I have not seen that myself. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's just either it's not a clear day or I'm not paying attention. Mountain biking here is really great. Dirt bikes, I have a dirt bike touring business as well. So I'm not only a rock climbing guide, but I also have uh, multiple KTM dirt bikes here that we go out on. So dirt bikes, if people want to come down and they know how to ride, all you have to do is ask somebody, do you know how to ride? And if they say yes, you bring your boots and your gear and you can come down here and go out on dirt bikes on your rest day. Not that that's exactly a rest day, but it is a whole lot of fun. And then four by four tours. There's you know a lot of uh, Jeep touring here. That's really a lot of fun. And I'm not one really into Jeep touring, but I must say that it is quite enjoyable. All right, that's a really good picture of the cliff. You can see how large this cliff section is and you can see how vast it is. All the way to the right, those are 45 meter pitches right in the center, which is called La Proa, the prow. Those are anywhere from 25 to 35 meter pitches, let's say 30 meter pitches all the way around. And you can see the nature of the cliff here. You walk in and you walk down to the river valley and you climb there all day. Those are live oak trees. So you're amongst the oaks all day. And the climbing here is, I, you know, it's hard for somebody to say that this could be the best climbing on the Northern continent when you have Paradise Forks and Joshua Tree and Indian Creek and places like that. I would say for its type and for what it is, it's one of my favorite places on the Northern continent to climb. I do love, I do love Indian Creek. I do. And I love J Tree. Oh, I do. I've been to these places and I've climbed very hard in all these places. In, in the United States, Paradise Forks all over. There's a lot of good, even the New River Gorge has lots of good cracks. But the idea that you can do 30 meter pitches, it's endless. It's at 75 degrees all year long and you can hang out and walk in in two seconds flat. It's like a two minute approach really makes the place special. All right, and the, the culture in Aculco, those boys right there are cowboys. They go out on Sunday, but a lot, a lot of them, they work with those horses every day. If you think about the 1800s to early 1900s in the United States, 
So we had what was the Industrial Revolution, which, which pushed right into the Great Depression. Uh, the Grapes of Wrath was also written about that time frame. Here in Akulko, it's like that time frame in the United States because they plow their fields with horses and mules and they uh, harvest everything by hand. The Grapes of Wrath was taught, was written, a uh, book was written because the banks came in and leveraged everybody money for their tractors in the United States and said, now you can plow all the land and you can plant so much more seed that everybody's going to get rich. People don't realize that the Grapes of Wrath was written about a six year drought in the United States and that forced all the farmers off their land because they couldn't pay their bills after they bought all those fancy tractors. Here, I'd say 10 to 20 percent of the of the of the uh, of the of all the land is plowed with a tractor, maybe 20%, and everything is harvested by hand. So it's really, this is the breadbasket of Mexico. The, the picture on the right is just one I snapped the other day because I wanted to give you guys an idea of the cheese stores. And that's my personal favorite cheese store because they have a lot, like the Gouda cheese there, it's just delicious. So I really like that one. That's why I took a picture of it. But there's probably 15, 20, 30 cheese stores in town. And you wouldn't believe it because you're like, how can they have all these cheese stores? How can they all stay in business? Oh, they do because people come from all over to buy the cheese here. All right. Hilotepec. Hilotepec is about 55 minutes south of Ekulko. This is where they filmed part of the 2010 Petzl Rock Trip. Hilotepec is Las Peñas de Dexcani is the actual name. It's above the town of Lotepec. That is private property. It costs about $3 to get in. It goes to the Ajito, the Ajito, the Farmers Union, and they actually make improvements to the property so people can enjoy it for generations to come. That is the largest concentration of live oaks in the state of Mexico. And they do not want anybody going in there and chopping down oak trees. Yep, the Hedo can go in there and chop down those trees, but they can only do it with an ax. They have to pull it out with a burrow and they can only take out so much in so much time. It's renewable. They won't let anybody mess with that forest. Uh, it is gorgeous. That climbing there, uh, the picture on the left, you can see on the right edge of that picture, you can see the big overhanging bowl. And that is the hardest climbing in the wall of Mexico is, in, is here in Lothopec. So let me tell you a little about this place. It's a conglomerate volcanic tuff. It's, it's similar to the cobblestones in Cottonwood Canyon, but different. It's the same idea. If you picture a volcano exploding, putting out a huge cloud of dust, that dust settling and over a couple thousand years or million years, whatever it is, I don't know. Uh, however long it took, those cobbles settled and that's what you're climbing. You're climbing from cobble to cobble to cobble in overhanging territory, and it really is a lot of fun. I tell people it's a lot like an outdoor climbing gym, even though I don't really have much experience indoors. It's very similar to climbing gyms because all the holds protrude from the wall, and you try to figure out which is the best hold and whatever route you're climbing, and try to get through it, obviously, without fall on sighting. So uh, it's sport climbing. It's single pitch. It's up to 30 meters tall. This is also in the state of Mexico. This is in the town of Holotepec. Uh, it's 90 minutes from the Querétaro airport in a direct shot. This is at 9,000 feet in elevation. It's always cool there and you're climbing in the shade. It is a gorgeous place to climb. Alan, Alan, I must say, when you were there climbing with us last year and you weren't feeling really well or two years ago and you went up that 511, nobody could have been more proud of you, Alan. They're all like, how old is he? I'm like, whatever. I'm like, what do you mean age? They're like, that. He, he just flew up that 511 like it was nothing and everybody else was bowing down. They were so proud. And they're like, he doesn't even feel well. And I kept telling people, I'm like, I told you Alan can climb. I said, that dude can pull down. So, uh, the 2010 Petzl Rock Trip was filmed here, a large part of it. And if you go back and you Google it, you can see uh, Carlos, my main guide, a wonderful human being. You can see Carlos, he uh, is, you know, they talk to him a lot because he bolted routes here. And uh, it's really, it's wonderful to watch. I said it's a private preserve, it's on the mountainside, it's an oak forest. Let's see here. 
it's abundant sun and shade, whatever you want to do, depending on where you want to run to. I, like I said, I like to stay in the shade, so we kind of run through the shade all day. The lodging here, Halotepec, is not a magic town, but in a lot of ways it should be. It's a very pretty town. It's super clean, super neat, and there's hotels in this town. And right in the main square, the old main square, there's hotels there that are just gorgeous, delicious food, gorgeous hotels, and you can taxi back and forth to the uh, climbing if you want. Central Mexico, Aculco, and Halotepec, the thing about these places is that, especially in my town of Aculco, there's lots and lots and lots of affordable taxis. The farmers do not have the money for cars. So what they do is they live out in the outskirts of this town, uh, hundreds of miles in every direction, actually. I mean, not hundreds, let's say 50 miles in each direction. It's still Aculco, and it's all farming, and they come in every Sunday. All, all the farmers, just like you would think it would be in the United States back in the 30s and the 40s, and people would come to town just on Sunday. They get all their supplies, and they go back out to their farms. So the to roll around in Hilo and Aculco kind of with a taxi is an expensive, fast, and easy. The lodging there is really nice and clean. Rest days in, uh, rest days in Hilotepec, uh, hiking and exploring the town. And the Monarch Butterfly Preserve is right near, nearby as well, the Monarch Butterflies. They fly right through this area, and there's several locations that you can go to, and you can walk up into the mountains, and it's kind of trippy because there's like millions upon millions of butterflies, and they're all flittering around at the same time, and it's kind of overwhelming sometimes when they start flying around you because they're like all around your body. It's pretty cool. It's something to see. It really is. It really is something to see here. There's the boys. Those are absolutely positively the cowboys. And I keep saying that because in the United States, I grew up in New Jersey. We had this bar near me and they had like country Western night and everybody dressed up like a cowboy and they'd go down there and do line dancing. And I'd be like, yeah, that's great and all, but they don't even know that the, they wouldn't know the smart end of a horse if they saw one. So these gentlemen, uh, if you walked down and you told one of these gentlemen that you wanted to go horseback riding the next day, they'd be like, what time? That would be their only question. They'd be like, what time do you want to go, go riding? because it is just beautiful horseback riding territory. Northern Mexico's cactus and a lot of hot sun. We're here, it's so temperate. And Mexico, uh, uh, El Potrero's 100% cactus, if 99.9%. .9%. Here, where I am in central Mexico, it's maybe 3% cactus, three. So between the volcanic soil being very, very fertile, the lack of cactus, the lack of rocks, it really is great times when you're, if you like horses, this is a really good time. Dirt bikes still, but horseback riding is really special. Uh, the picture on the right is that tree that's growing out in the middle of the road. And there's a different idea set on animals in the central Mexico because they're all farmers. So they treat their animals very well and trees and such. That tree is in the middle of the road almost. They leave that tree there because that tree means more to them than cutting it down and having another parking spot. And when you walk up and you ding it and you walk around that tree in Olotepec, it's very impressive. And there's trees all around that part of town that you can't even believe how big they are. It's just the town is very old and nobody, nobody's gonna mess with their trees. All right, now moving right along. So this is pictures of Chonta. Chonta Cuatlan, Chonta Cuatlan. I wish, is Mac, are you on here right now? I wonder if my, my main man, Mac, has made this, made it tonight. I was hoping he was, because he's, because he is uh, Mexican, and when he pronounces things, they sound really beautiful compared to my pronunciations of these words. So Chonta is limestone tufas. This is very uh, special because we're in the middle of a volcanic belt, and yet there's still limestone to be climbed around us. In the north of Mexico, it's all limestone. There's nothing else really until you go out into the state of Chihuahua that you can start finding granite. Uh, here, where I am, like I said, there's 13 different kinds of rock and this limestone at Chanta is very special. If, you've ne if you don't know anything about this place, it's in the state of Guerrero and it's right near the town of Taxco. Taxco is a magic town, just like Aculco and Bernal. So Taxco is very, very beautiful, very special. Um, it's south of Mexico City. So if you flow into Toluca, 
is about 2.5 hours away. Mexico City is 3.5 hours away, but I still tell people if they want to go to Chonta, the fly in Querétaro, climb in Bernal, climb in some of the other areas, and you can narrow it down to like a three, three and a half hour trip, depending on what time you go. If you leave here from my house in Eculto, you can make it there, you know, early in the morning pretty fast because you go through Toluca and down. Climbing all year long, if you uh, go to that 2010 Pestle Rock trip and you go on YouTube, you're going to see lots of pictures of Chonta. When they did the 2010 rock trip, there was a handful of routes there. There really wasn't that much. Uh, Carlos Garcia, who I mentioned earlier, my main man, great human being, has put up 60 routes there himself. Chonta is the largest cave that's climbed in the world. That's seven pitches tall. There's a seven pitch climb there. That's 513. That takes the 513 climbers and makes them cry because it's pitch after pitch after pitch of overhanging tufa climbing. Yeah, even the strongest people come down and they immediately lay down on the ground and they take a nap because they, they, you, if you're strong and you like that type of climbing, this is a great place. Um, let's see here. Uh, where to stay? The property itself is the ranch of John, uh, Don Procopio, and Don Procopio owns that property. It is private property. You do pay to get in there. I think it's $5 to get in, and then you pay for burros or mules to carry your pack up to the climbing, so it's kind of a hike uphill. But you can camp at Don Procopio's, or you can stay down the road in the town. Here in this area, there's a national park that's famous for its caves. So people in the summertime go there because they want to go check out all the different caves and the different features there. So there is uh, uh, places that you can rent, Airbnb, and there's cabins there. I always tell people it's best right now, especially with uh, COVID, to get a cabin because you can cook there and you could have shelter and then you can drive back and forth. If you want to, you can stay in Taxco, which is a magic town. There's definitely hotels, restaurants, anything you want. To say you are a climber and your boyfriend is kind of a climber or your husband is kind of a climber and you have kids or you're the climber and your wife kind of enjoys it but isn't totally down with it and you have kids. What's nice about coming to these magic towns is that if one partner or the other doesn't want to go full, full hog and go climbing all the time, Taxco is a place that you could spend days let alone a day there, just walking around because it's that pretty. Between the museums and all the shopping, Bernal's the same way. You could leave the wife and kids or the husband and kids down in these towns and they're really, really nice. Um, let's see, and the tax goes about 30 minutes away. So it's, you know, you can get there back and forth pretty easy. Hotels, restaurants, and, uh, or artesian, artesian goods are lots and lots of handmade stuff. Uh, Mac, uh, Carlos is also working on a brand new guide for, uh, for Chonta, being as he's put up 60 plus pitches there. I can't think of anybody better to write a new guidebook because he, uh, you know, he's actually bolting the routes. And the very picture with the red, uh, with the red helmet on, that's Mac right there. So that's a picture of him on his way up bolting a new route. Very strong climber, one of the strongest climbers in Mexico, and one of the safest as far as the guide service goes. I can't, couldn't ask for a more professional guide to be working for me. Uh, rest days, the check out the area caves in the national park, hiking, exploring the town of Taxco, and uh, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much good for Chonta. And there's another picture of uh, the climbing in the cave. And then uh, climbers headed up with the burrows and the donkeys. All right, let's see what we got now. Las Manzanas. So this area is west of Mexico City. Let's see what we got. Let me turn this around. This is the Parque Eco Turistico Santa Maria Maipla. This is also known as Las Manzanas. This is an ecotourist, ecotourist park because there's mountain biking, bouldering, hiking, rock climbing. There's all sorts of cool stuff to do here. 
So this eco tourist park is you have to pay to get in $50 to get in by $50, 50 pesos per person to get in $2 and 50 cents, then a dollar 50 to park. So you figure, you know, for a few dollars spent, it's private property and they really take nice, nice care of the place. Trad climbing, sport climbing, bouldering, and then of course the mountain biking there. They have a big mountain bike uh, tracks there where they have jumps. That's very popular now, even in Mexico, which is amazing, where you go downhill tracks and they have jumps all over the place. A little bit much for me, but for people who really like the mountain bike, it is the bee's knees if you like to go downhill and take those jumps the way they do now. Um, it's about an hour from Mexico City. It's about an hour and a half from Toluca, hour and 15, depending where you're in Toluca which is a city that's west of Mexico City. At Culco, it's about two hours away. Here, again, this is a basalt, and the weather is always perfect in this part of Mexico. If you know anything about Mexico City, the reason why the, the native Indians settled there so long ago is because of the lake, which is now no longer there, and also because the weather is perfect every day. That's why people go and settle in this part of Mexico, because if you don't like hot weather, it's never hot. And if you don't like cold weather, it's really never cold. It's always pretty much, like you said, perfect here. The, the winter here is about a week and a half long. That's winter, and I think that's perfect. 10 days of winter is fine for me. Uh, climbing, like I said, it's uh, anywhere from 12 meter blocks up to 35 meters tall. It's very tech, technique driven sport climbing. Uh, so on vertical to overhanging rock, it's a very smooth basalt. It's a very interesting rock at Las Manzanas. Oops, let me go back to where that one is before we move on. It's a very interesting rock. Uh, the nature of the rock isn't the basalt that a lot of people have seen. It's more solid conglomerate of basalt, less cracks, more face climbing. And uh, Carlos, also has a guidebook for this place, which I showed in the guidebook pages. If I uh, didn't actually talk about that, he wrote the book for this area, very well put together, very user-friendly, and it gets you all around a very large area of, of uh, you know, a mountain, a whole mountain valley. Um, I can always get people information on how to get that book if they need it. The lodging, there are cabins right here below the climbing. Uh, Airbnb as well. It's a great resource because you can find the cabins there, book them online, and you can see exactly, you can take tours of the different cabins there. Rest days, it's an eco park, uh, so exploring, mountain biking, things like that. The Mineral del Chico, this is the last on the stop of what I'm covering today. This is the first national park in Mexico. Mineral del Chico is famous because of its uh, town there and the silver mining that went on in the turn of the century. Now it's a national park. It's absolutely gorgeous. The climbing there is up to 10 pitches tall, 15, 10 to 12, 15 pitches tall, depending on where you are. It's a conglomerate, very similar to Lotepec. It's a gorgeous place to visit. It's outside the city of Pachuca. Once you go and you get in here, it's a very small town. I include it now because these places are so close together that it's easy to go visit them all if you're in this part of Mexico. But what I will say is that it's pretty much closed now. This is a mountain town. They're very, very, very conservative because it's so far away from everything else that nobody there wants to get, nobody there wants COVID anywhere near them. So when you drive up into the mountain, they actually have uh, people that stop you and they, you know, they look at me, they take one look at me and they know that I'm actually not actually living in that town. So they turn you around pretty fast. It's definitely worth coming and checking it out. As soon as the vaccine is widely distributed and this all goes in the past and we can all look back on it and be like, man, that really sucked. Uh, this place will be open again, and it really, I can't stress how gorgeous it is just to go up to this mountain town, to this national park, and just check it out. It really is nice, and that's Mineral del Chico, El Chico National Park. Mineral del Chico is actually the town. It's El Chico National Park, and uh, for anything that you want to do as far as uh, rest day activities. They have mountain biking and horseback riding and four wheel drive trucks that go around. They have lots of different things to do. It's just at this point, you know, I just want to show everybody it. So that way in the future, you know, it's there. All right. Rest days. There's 
a picture of me and the boys going out on some dirt bike touring. Uh, as I said, there's lots of stuff to do in this part of Mexico. Another reason why I moved down here is because 5% cactus and the mountains here are so large and so vast with those oak trees that we're standing by. That's never ending dirt bike riding. It'll never, ever, ever end. It's just, it's like the, it's like a whole nother universe. Every time you go around to a different side of a mountain, you can ride anywhere you want. We leave right from the house, which is amazing too, because anybody knows about dirt bikes. Sometimes like where I grew up, you had a trailer to get to places here. You just push out the driveway. We close the gate, we get on, we get the bike started and we show up back here eight hours later, exhausted. All right. Food accommodations. Can't stress it enough really delicious food in this part of Mexico. That dish that you see with the rice and the mole, that's the Mexican restaurant Bernal. I could eat at that restaurant every night. It is so good and it's so uh, uh, typical of Mexican mole. It's so culturally specific that you eat it and because we're climbers, you end up ordering a whole nother main dish. And I know that sounds completely gluttonous, but it's so good. You're like, man, it's only like six bucks for a main course. Bring me another. And then you eat it. And when you go home, you sleep like a rock and you get up the next day and you go climb. So it really is good. Uh, the food is delicious in this part of the country. And I say that uh, because if you know about like Northern Mexico, the food there is good, but it's very meat heavy and they don't eat vegetables. So being able to come and really be like, you know, go to different restaurants and have different plates put in front of you and uh, understand the variety in that town. And, you know, cool go down the end. I mean, this is the first place that I ate crickets and I ordered them grasshoppers by accident because it was on a special menu and it looked cool. And when they brought out these huge grasshoppers, I'm like, whoa, I'm like, I ordered grasshoppers. And then my friends and I, we ended up eating them and they were delicious. Tastes like anything else. Tastes like popcorn. So yeah, really good place to come visit as far as eating. That's a huge part of what makes places special for me. Rest activities, magic towns, beautiful. Um, explore artisanal shops. As I said, there's lots of stuff here to check out and to buy and to bring, bring you know, presents home to your family. Delicious local cheeses, the ice cream. You know, when we're in Bernal, we're climbing hard and we walk down the mountain to go to the restaurants. We get appetizer ice cream on our way down the hill and we eat ice cream all the way to the restaurant. Then we eat our whole meal and then we walk back up the hill and we get dessert ice cream on the way up. And I know it sounds horrendous, but you'll be there as well. Avocados, I mean, to eat avocados like four times, five times a day is delicious because they're eight cents here versus $2 in the US. Um, the Mayan ruins are right nearby. So you have the pyramids that are east of Mexico City that are very worth going and checking out. Dirt bike riding, of course, love dirt bikes. That's, you know, as far as rock climbing and dirt biking, they're just good times. Horseback riding, if I had enough property here, I would have a horse, or if not three, because so you have to have guest horses for all your friends. Yeah, that's like dirt bikes, you have to have more than one. The hot springs, those are closer to Bernal. They're in San Miguel de Allende which is about 45 minutes north of Bernal. And if you know or ever heard or familiar with Mexico, San Miguel de Allende is the largest population of expats in all of Mexico. There are laws in Mexico that prevent people from buying any land near the coast because they know damn well that if we could buy land near the coast, the gringos would come down here and they'd buy up every inch of coast and not let anybody near it. So one of the rules in Mexico is that we cannot buy any land anywhere near the ocean. You can go a couple blocks off and you're okay. Well, the workaround for that is San Miguel de Allende. There's a huge lake there and they bought up the whole lake. So very arty, very artis artisanal town, art as far as paintings and artists. And it's kind of like Woodstock, New York, sort of in a lot of ways. And it really is a lot of fun. And the hot springs that are two seconds outside of town, Monday through Friday, are absolutely positively worth visiting there. The hot springs are clean. They're beautiful. The property is beautiful. And you could just lay there in that hot water all day. It's a healing hot spring for sure. Um, 
uh, paragliding in Valle de Bravo. So Valle de Bravo isn't far from here as well. And if you know anything about Mexico, Valle de Bravo is another lake town. Valle de Bravo is probably one of the wealthiest towns in Mexico. The lake that surrounds that, the town that surrounds the lake there is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, supposedly there's a, a nightlife there uh, as far as people going out and drinking and things like that. Not that I've ever done it there because you know, between rock climbing, dirt biking and everything else we do, I don't know, the, the drinking goes to the back, gets pretty pushed pretty far back in line. So there's paragliding in Valle de Bravo if people wanna go there and take tandem flights with an instructor or whatever they wanna do, that's also available. So I wanted to mention that and then also, the uh, hiking in Toluca, Nevado de Toluca. And if anybody, if you know, if you're a hiker, you know that I think that's one of the top 10 hikes in the world. That Nevado de Toluca is a hike that encompasses, I think, two of the volcanoes there. And it's a huge hike and people come from all over to do it. I've been asked as a guide service to go there and to guide it, but uh, it's just too far out of my realm. Carlos said he would do it. He said he was happy to, but uh, and, you know we have to drive a lot farther than we want to. It was just uh, just to put it all together was too much. So well, I'll go there hiking myself, but as far as guiding that thing, it's just you know it's easier just to stay near the house. Why I recommend Central Mexico for people who want to check out Mexico is the weather is consistent. There's not as much crowds here as all uh, at all compared to. Uh, uh, like the Potrero, because people start to get a little bit worn down by people, you know, all over you all the time, the noise that goes along with it, the variety of climbing, because there's 13 different kinds of rock around where I live, that you can just, you know, spin the wheel and decide where you want to go climbing for the day. The cultural and rest day variety for people in their relationships, because you have to find balance for rock climbers. We all know that we're a lot, anybody ever have a Malamute or a Husky? You know that if you take the dog off a leash, it'll run away and never turn around and look at you. You could have that dog your whole life, pamper that dog, pet that dog, feed that dog, but the second that he gets loose, he's running away. Climbers are very similar. They stand there at the screen door and they're always staring outside, always staring outside that screen door, wondering where the next location is. Rock climbers, they end up booking all their vacation and all their time off and they just put it all away ahead of time knowing that they're going to be going someplace, someplace really cool, someplace new. So rock climbers, right, say are very, very similar to these Malamutes because once you get off your leash, you just keep running. So these areas are very nice because if you're going to run and you could bring your family with you and they can enjoy themselves as well, that's really, that's quite a bonus there versus if you go to the post road and you bring your wife and kids eh, there's not a whole lot for people to do there if you're not climbing all right contact me so this is important we're winding down here as far as a rock climber and a guide i tell people all the time that not only am i a guide but i'm also a mentor and i'm also someone that you can contact at any time whether it's from this presentation that you want to contact me for questions, fantastic. You can always contact me by, by email. Also, my phone number. I'll tell you a quick story because we must be getting close to out of time. Shawnee, baby, are you still there? How much time do we have? I wonder where Shawnee went. I kind of lost her on my screen, but I'm not sure how long we've been talking here. But I'll say something really quick. I took people climbing in the gunks and I told them the same thing, that we are now... Uh, tied together as climbers and that if they ever have a problem that they can get a hold of me and it doesn't matter where they are or what they're doing if something seems a little strange to give me a ring so one day I'm standing there and my cell phone rings and I answer it and it's these two people husband and wife and they were out in the Grand Tetons and they had booked a guide for two people for a day of climbing and when they got there they're all of a sudden getting pushed into a group of six and they didn't understand why. And they called me. They said, Simeon, why exactly do we book for two? And we're six people now going out in the group. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, the person that you booked with, are they there? And they were like, he sure is. And I'm like, put the guy on the phone. So they put the guy on the phone and I said, hello. And I said, so tell me who didn't show up. 
and they're like, he's like, excuse me. And I'm like, tell me honestly, because I'm a guide service and I know how it is. Which one of your guides didn't show up? Because you're taking two people who bought a, you know, a day as a deuce and you're putting them out with the group and everybody knows that that isn't kosher. You just don't do that. So the gentleman got quiet real quick on the phone and I said, I knew that that was the situation. And I said, close up the shop. And I said, take those two people out yourself because it's not worth the bad business versus you closing up that shop and taking people out climbing. So that's what ended up happening. Somebody didn't show up. He was forcing these two people out with other climbers and they were not happy about it whatsoever. They called me, I straightened it out on the phone with them. The, that was Eckies there. I guess they're big out there in the Tetons. And they, uh, a gentleman that I knew was actually working for them. And he was out that day in a group at a wall. And he was kind of, uh, to say he wasn't the, the, the happiest with the way that we had had our conversation. And the gentleman had mentioned my name, like who the heck is this dude? And the Blake who was there climbing with him, who I knew as a guy said, what? And then he turned and he looked at them and he told them exactly, you know, why I would say such a thing and who I am as a person and a guy and a climber and everything else. And for whatever reason, it must have worked out nicely because the guy actually wrote me back. He wrote me and he told me that he understood what I was saying and that he took those people out himself and that it was the right decision. But in the moment when he was pushing them out with other people, he wasn't thinking about the client. He was thinking more about how he was going to make his day easier and it doesn't always work that way. So the moral of the story is that anybody on this, on this, you know, website, this webinar is if, you know, you have my email, my phone numbers, and you're anywhere, anytime, whether you're buying gear, whether you're going rock climbing and something doesn't seem right, anytime, I'm almost always available by cell phone. And if it does go to my voicemail or you write me an email, as soon as I get back within cell phone range, of course, I'll call you right back. Um, that's my contact. That's my spiel for that because we're all tied together with a rope. It's the pilot and the co-pilot. I tell people the person that's leading is the pilot and the co-pilot is just as important. Uh, as far as this webinar goes, we're all rock climbers and I go to great lengths to make sure everybody's safe as a guide. And I also want to make sure people have a good time. Um, with that said, if you're not having a good time and you're in another country or another climbing area, I'll go to great lengths to try to straighten things out. And if you're buying equipment and such, I can tell people, you know, why you might want a certain equipment versus others, depending on what you're doing, whether you're top roping with a thick rope or getting on your lead head and you're going to buy something that's a little bit easier to push through a device. Special offers you know, for the webinar, participants, of course, as a guide service, you can see the 20% off when booking for three days or 20% off booking and paying by December, you know, mid-December. That's, uh, that's all. If you know somebody that's looking for a guide because I'm not pushing my services on anybody. I want to say that because, you know, if you know anybody that's looking for a guide, if you know anybody coming to Mexico, you'd be surprised at how many people come through and they just, you know, find us and they come climbing. All right. Questions. There's my little doggy. See my little Jack Russell? That's when she was a puppy. Now, it's not, not the cutest Jack Russell ever. She is the bee's knees as far as Jack Russells go. She's the greatest dog ever. Doesn't have a mean bone in her whole body. That little Jack Russell, she wouldn't hurt anything. That's, so that's, that's quite the special Jack Russell compared to the last one I learned. So, all right. So, questions. I'll leave it up to you guys. I met her when she was a little pup. I have a question. She's the cutest dog ever. Totally. I have a question. Um, uh, last spring, I went climbing um, in Wyoming at um, Devil's Tower. Um, how does that rail light compare to the Devil's Tower climbing light? I mean, I was climbing on like five nine, and it was like stout. So that's a great question. The Devil's Tower climbing is similar in the way that you're crack climbing but it's different because there it's so smooth. It's very hard to use your feet outside the crack a lot of times, correct? Unless you're stemming. <laughs> exactly, that's it. So you have the crack or you have stems. Here in Aculto de Espinosa, every climb is different. There are no two climbs that are even close to being similar and your feet are outside the crack, I'd say, 90% of the time, 
The reason why I love it here, I do love Indian Creek, but it starts to hurt my feet after a while because your feet are in the crack all the time. It's almost mandatory. Here versus Devil's Tower is that it's extremely technique driven. So the crack climbing here, your feet are outside the crack using different dimples and different features on the rock. And as I said, if you come here and you lead three pitches in a day, you've had a really, really, really good day. Like when we're at the gunks, I could lead 11 pitches in a day when I'm guiding six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pitches in a day. And you can move right along. So the gunks is a lot of yada, yada, yada. You pull hard and then you keep going. It's one crux of climbs. Here in Akulco, as soon as you touch the rock, it's game on. And it's really good. It's very well protected. There's only a few climbs here that don't have protection that I call PG. And considering what we all go through, the PG here is really, it's let's call it GP. It just means your feet are at the gear. You don't really have to go farther than that before you put in another piece of gear. That's a great question. Anybody else? Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, traveling safely, uh, especially if you're driving your own car? Are there any concerns? You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's not safe down there, blah, 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 but what's the reality? Fantastic question. I'm so glad you asked that question. So when you cross from Texas into Mexico, because if you're gonna be climbing into Potrero, there's no reason in the world to cross into Mexico before you get to Laredo, Texas, because it's about three hours south of Laredo and you wanna cross right there. If you cross anywhere else in Mexico, you can take pay roads, but it can cost you $80 to get from any, you know, from other uh, places like uh, Arizona and such to go through to the Potrero. So it's best to drive through Texas, cross through Laredo. In Laredo, there are several bridges the best bridge to cross is called the Columbia Bridge, Columbia. And the Columbia Bridge is actually northwest of Laredo. And it's so quiet there that when you pull in, you look around and you're like, hello? Hello? You're like, is anybody here? Versus Laredo proper, which is a very busy crossing. So the Columbia Bridge with your sticker that you can get online, and then you cross, I tell people you cross during the daylight. Don't be going through Laredo at night because it's not a very pleasant city, Nuevo Laredo. Laredo is fine, of course, that's the US. But Nuevo Laredo, if you cross 10 o'clock in the morning on any given day and you go right onto the pay roads, fast and easy. I have never had a problem driving in Mexico. I've had more problems driving in the United States than I ever have in Mexico. More key beta is that the only time I've ever had problems with the police as far as looking for any type of bribes, it was uh, in Nueva Laredo once. And the key to that is, is you just look at them and you're like, man, you're absolutely right. Let's just take this on down to the police station and figure it on out. And if they're trying to shake you down because you know damn well you didn't do anything, as soon as you tell them you want to go to the police station to figure it on out, they're going to let you go in about two seconds flat because they do not want to go back to the police station because chances are the people there are not corrupt and they're not going to let it happen. So the best thing to do is A, you know, drive during the day because it's, you know, Mexico is a strange place. There could be horses on the road, horses, cows, you know, even javelinas. They have a type of pig in Northern Mexico that they cruise around and when they run across the road, you're like, what the hell was that? Was that a pig? So there's lots of animals on the road and Mexico is a lot darker than most countries. For some reason, it's very dark at night here. So I tell people to drive during the day, take the pay road for sure, have pesos before you cross the border because you need pesos because they do not take American dollars on the pay road. And then uh, just cross over, get right on the pay road. Google, Google is always your friend. AT&T, you can cross right over into Mexico with AT&T on your cell phone and it doesn't need any programming or anything like that. Uh, anybody else, you can get a Mexico plan and just Google. You know, Google Maps is your friend. Cross over and just go right to the Potrero. It's easy, really. I mean, the pay road now from Laredo to Nuevo Laredo to the Potrero is the nicest I've ever seen. I just drove it and it's in really, really good shape. And uh, I couldn't have been more impressed. Uh, I've never, like I said, I've never had problems driving in Mexico. I actually enjoy it. And the drive 
from the Potrero, where my property I sold to my buddy Rick, who does the developing there, because he was living on the property anyway. It was kind of like a no to buy it. Uh, from the Potrero to where I live now in central Mexico is about 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours, depending on the drive and the traffic as far as accidents. And it's a beautiful drive to do during the day. It is beautiful. Once you get over the mountains from Saltillo and you come down into the desert of Chihuahua, the road, it's all pay roads down through San Luis Potosí and the different states you're going to be driving through. It's a gorgeous drive. It's like, it's like driving through the West, you know, driving through, uh, you know, the national parks out West. It really is pretty. So uh, cross during the day, get your import for your vehicle online from the Banco uh, Ban Banjarcito. Go right into the place in Nuevo Laredo and get your uh, your visitor permit as far as your, you know, for uh, your uh, stamp to have your visa. It takes about five minutes. Then you get right on the payroll during the day because nobody really starts problems during the day that I've ever heard of. It always happens at night. And then uh, just get right on the payroll and before you know it, you'll be right in the place. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have anything, a couple. Anything? Uh, first uh, off, uh, oh, good, a couple. I I, love it. <laughs> uh, my fiance actually lives just an hour from where you're currently staying uh, over in Alacamolco, so I go down there fairly frequently. Uh, it's very nice to see those areas. I never knew about Acurco. <laughs> I learn something new every day. But um, yeah, uh, my question would be for somebody then who's had no experience doing any climbing. Um, where would you recommend going to first? And my second question is, uh, for me, myself, I'm more into bouldering than sport climbing and tread climbing. So if I didn't want to deal with the whole hassle of bringing my crash pad down there, are there any areas that I could look into like renting or even buying a, a crash pad around there to use? Absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that as well. Hey, no, that huge monolith on the back side of that monolith in the shade, that's called uh, Chichido, C H I C H I D apostrophe, uh, apostrophe H O, Chichido. Chichido is a campground and they own the whole back of the, of the uh, monolith. Now, owning, of course, in Mexico is some very strange things, but that's private property. <laughs> they have the whole back of the monolith. Campground, and it's also 99% of the boulderings there, and they have boulder pads there that you can borrow. So you can get a guidebook from them for bouldering, get the boulder pads from them, and you can also go there and meet lots of cool people because being a guide, I've had clients come down with their uh, younger children who were climbers that I was climbing with. And then, you know, you're talking to them and they say they really like the boulder. And I'm like, well, you definitely want to take a day and go to, to Chido, go bouldering. And as soon as you fall in, especially if it's or Sunday, if you fall in with the locals there bouldering, you'll have friends for life there. They're going to tell you they, everybody here in Mexico are so such people that they're going to want to know where you're from, what you're doing and when you're going to come back to hang. Cool. Thank you. No problem at all. Any other questions? I got some comments. Easy. <laughs> sure. You ready? So, uh, first uh, of all, yeah, I think so. I guess no, they're, they're all good. <laughs> so, the, uh, for anyone who hasn't been down there, I've been down there five, at least five times. The Mexicans are wonderful. And if you haven't been outside of the States, it's just a, another great experience, even if you don't do anything. Uh, I think it's one of the safest places I've been to, especially all the town magicos. Um, I've been out as late as could be that the towns actually close up pretty early. so. You'll be the last one walking home. There'll be no one on the street, and you don't feel anything, uh, you know, nervous at all. Uh, it's good to speak a little Spanish. People would appreciate it. The when you get down to Sims area, you're pretty high up, so 
the more time you can spend down there, you, because like you start climbing at like eight or 9,000 feet and uh, you might be winded if you're coming from, you know, from the East Coast or somewhere down low. Uh, Mexico City is really a fantastic place to visit. Don't drive there. If you're coming from where Simeon, you can take a bus right into it in like, I don't know, an hour, two hours maybe. Um, it's just an incredible city to visit um, on a rest day. And for, uh, for those of you who don't know Simeon, even if you came down there and you didn't climb at all, you would have a great time. But he is also just a, uh, you know, a wonderful guide and a wonderful person. So um, hopefully COVID's going to be over and we'll be down there soon. <laughs> I hope so, Al. Excellent. So I really appreciate everybody coming and attending. Like I said, I mean, I really enjoy it. I enjoy uh, getting out and talking to climbers. I enjoy uh, telling people about Mexico, especially, you know, I put up a lot of time, a lot of routes in the Potrero. I bolted a lot of routes, put my heart and soul into the place. And now I'm down here and I'm starting over again, trying to get things going down here because I, uh, you know, developed a, a, a long route in Bernal two years ago, last year, I don't know, time flies, put up a big route in Bernal and doing lots of multi-pitch, uh, lots of single pitch stuff and just really creating an ecotourism paradise for people because coming here is, it's really wonderful in this town because where the United States has gone is that even when traveling across the U.S., it's hard for me because when I'm driving, I have to have all the food in my van because I can't eat at any exit. I'm very particular about my food. Coming from New Jersey, I like diner food. And as I tell people, if there's a menu in that restaurant and that menu is anywhere else in the United States, I'm not eating there because I like micro. I like mom and pop. Everything I like, I like it to be cooked there. I like it to be fresh. And I like to know that the owner is actually taking the money and putting it in their pocket instead of at the end of the night, sending all the receipts to some faraway bank and uh, letting everybody go at night who has no real skin in the game. Where I am here in Mexico, especially my town, if you go into a restaurant, chances are the owner is gonna come out and he's gonna talk to you and ask you in English where you're from, probably broken English and it might be a little rugged, but your Espanol might be rugged when you answer. So everything here is micro in my town. When you go and eat breakfast, that's the owner. When you go to the ice cream store, that's the owner standing right in front of you. Everything here is micro, and that's what I love about it. And when I, when climbers come here to visit and they go to the town, all the money stays right here in the town. I'm huge into uh, lifting up, you know, how they say about the uh, tide raises all ships. And when people come here and you spend your money here, it stays right here in the town and you actually, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful place and they're beautiful people. So thanks everybody for joining and I really appreciate y'all being here.